Tell me Why do you hurt me so Breaking my body Over and over Heed my words You are of endless worth Come unto me Now and forever Now by grace know my name Like a flood arresting your heart So come out of the dark And let there be I was born on the 10th of March 1980. For the first 10 months of my life I was called Martin Philip O'Brien. I had two biological parents, an Irish mother and a Scottish father. My biological mother being rather immature and my bi biological father even an alcoholic. The thing is, I've not seen them in 32 years. And to be honest with you, I've gave up trying. When I got adopted at 10 months old, my name was changed. My name was changed to Kevin William McIntyre. I was brought into a living family, a caring family. I was very well brought up. This uh, new ready-made family, it was absolutely fantastic. I had a big sister as well. She always took good care of me, you know. For the first five years of my life, we lived in, we lived in East End of Glasgow. We lived in Torcross. And then we moved. We moved to Kilmel. I had loads of family, relatives and friends there. The thing is, I didn't know who I was. What I didn't realise was that having two biological parents and before I just got adopted, you know, it was like Kevin came through loads and loads and loads of different foster parents. So technically, I had like five mas and dads. Living in Camille wasn't easy. You always had to watch your back. Right from the very beginning, I can always remember that I always tried to take control. A lot of control. I had to learn to stick up for myself. And for a short while I could. It didn't take long until I went to primary school. When I went there, everything was brilliant. My mum always taught me that this world was a bad world. And from then, I loved this fear. I didn't like fear. I didn't even like myself. I suppose everybody just wants to be loved and cared for. The thing is, my family done their best. I'm my relatives. They were really nice people. I hated primary school. I really hated it. I hated getting bullied. I was somebody who went to school 
and I love to act and sing and dance but I sense for other people that they didn't like that. What I know today is that it wasn't my problem, it was their problem and they were jealous and full of envy. Every and again I always think about the past. I always think about the bad times and they're the kind of things that kind of set me back a little. It didn't take long until I started getting into trouble. I suppose in a way I was just looking for attention. I was addicted to smashing Wendy's. I even stole your norms. That's probably because you argued with the next door neighbour. I had a lot of pals in the past, but for some reason I always fell out with them. See today, I know that. I know where I've been wrong. I had a lot of girlfriends at primary school as well. But every week I always had a new one. I used to dump them all the time. But see when they dump me, I used to think primary school was a brilliant thing. But see when I got bullied, I couldn't stand it. I felt as if life had disappeared. It just like dissolved in front of me. I didn't speak about my problems. I just let them manifest inside me. I wish I did speak about these problems. I hated bullying. I hated being a victim. Everybody picked on me because I had jailed hair. And see on my clothes, they were always ironed. And see my shoes, they were always polished. Alright, so I lived in a housing scheme. But it just so happened my man and I lived in a private housing scheme thanks to the council houses and I don't think the people actually like that I think they actually seen something in me that they would never have but I didn't speak about my problems, I used to go to my bedroom and I would sit there playing with my toys I used to play with Action Force G.I. Joe stuff Sometimes I played my computer. And see when I became angry? Do you know what I done? I'll tell you what I fucking done. I used to smash up my house. My, my wee house was my bedroom. That's where I felt safe and secure. I'd be smashed the whole thing up. Two seconds later my man and dad would run up the stairs. And I would only get smacked for it and I could tear it off. So it didn't take long at all. Well, it didn't take long until I started crying. I hated myself. I didn't like myself. I didn't love myself. For a long period, I'd, I just didn't want to be known. I was full of fear. I was terrified. It was like I was going through one of the traumatic times. All I had to do was like put my heart on that for help, but I didn't bother. I just kept it to myself. I remember the names. A lot of times people used to call me a puff. They used to call me a homo, a gay boy, all that sort of stuff. And I thought to myself, why is everybody saying this? See, to be honest with you, I really don't know. 
My dad knew I was full of fear, so he got me involved in athletics and boxing. I had to keep myself fit, keep myself strong. Within a short period of time, I became really fit. I was in athletics six times a week. I was going to boxing three times a week. To be honest with you, I didn't really like doing athletics, but I became really successful at it. And as well as that, the boxing as well. I won a lot of races. I didn't always come first. Started off, I was last. Then I would move up. I would come third, I would come second. And then I became first. I kept trying and trying and trying. I used to get on really well with my man dad at that time. The thing is I always seemed to get on well with my man dad if I just listened to their advice. I've always been told never knock back sound advice. But quite a lot of times I just done what I wanted to do. I didn't know I was selfish. I didn't know I was self seeking I didn't know I was dishonest. I didn't know I was frightened. And I certainly didn't know I was inconsiderate. Quite a lot of times I used to look at my bedroom window and I would see all the nets running by and I wanted to be like them. So anyway, I was looking out the bedroom one day and I seen all the nerds running by. They were always laughing and joking and always had girlfriends and really materialistic clothing. They used to run by with their bear horses and their Nike Air Max. Some supported Celtic and some supported Rangers and normally they would walk a bit with these skip hats on. I used to say to my man dad quite a lot, is it alright if I can go out? But they knew where they lived wasn't exactly the place where you'd want to hang about. I mean these people that were walking by, there were people that were bullying me and stuff like that. But I kind of kept myself to myself. I really loved my man dad. I just wish I could love myself. Didn't take long still. I really didn't take long until I started arguing. I started arguing a lot with my man and dad. They wouldn't let me out. Any time they did let me out, the police always came to the door. Gave me some trouble again. My man and dad would say, What's he done now? He smashed another windy. You shouldn't be hanging about with the people. So then I would get kept in. It wasn't a day or two, it was always maybe two or three months at a time. Then again I looked at the bedroom one day and I seen them all walking by. 
laugh and joke more with other ghetto friends and other else. I was full of resentment. I was full of anger. Full of pain. Misery and rage. I was absolutely disgusted with myself. Because I knew deep down I had a good heart. But I just couldn't quite explain things properly. How I felt and stuff. So I gave up athletics and I gave up boxing. My mum was working part time. During the week, she would, she would walk off the bus. Fifteen months before that, I was off. I was working as a paper boy at the time. And that was my way to earn a decent wage. I mean, at that age, 15 quid was quite a lot. I really wanted to hang about the other ones. Didn't take long until I started running away. My dad used to come looking for me. And I always used to hide. There were many times I ran away from him. And see, every time I ran away, I was always full of tears. I didn't know how to express my feelings, I just didn't know. I didn't know my identity. My man and I said that I was adopted. And I used adoption as an excuse to be irrational. I felt as if the world owed me something. Something massive. Something big. The compensation in a sense. I totally regret all the things I've done in the past. I wish I never done them. You see, the thing is, during all these troubled times, I was going to secondary school at the time, and that was the same as primary school. I was going through first year, second, third and fourth. And I was still getting bullied and I was trying to fit in. But every now and again, my man and dad would get a phone call. It was a headmaster. I was either getting suspended, or else I was fighting, or else I was setting fires. I really didn't know what to do with myself. So basically, my man and dad were out the window. The only person I really cared about was myself. I was involved in night culture and we used to fight against other schemes nearby where we used to live. I seen a couple of people dying out it. I seen a lot of violence. I seen a lot of shouting and a lot of brick throwing as well. I didn't want to be a victim anywhere. You see, I just wanted revenge. I was looking for respect and acceptance, significance, to feel safe and secure, that belonging feeling, you know. See, to be honest with you, I actually love being a Ned. I wasn't one of the Neds that would run about and hit, hit you with like, a crowbar or anything like that, or, or stab you in the back or anything like that. I didn't use knives, I didn't use weapons, I used these. I used to think that being a part of a gang was a brilliant thing. I, had, I, I felt as if I had pals. But I realised they weren't my pals. What these people wanted me to do was to give them a laugh. And I was always a class clown. I was always the, the, the stupid one. The one that was always getting caught. The one that was always getting into trouble. The one that couldn't run quick enough. Made arguments came. I fell out with my man da over and over and over and over. Alcohol, that came out of my life in a big way. So I used to go to the pub. I used alcohol for escapism. It kind of helped me in a way. But I didn't know I was gone insane. 
My man and dad would always complain. And see my two sisters, they didn't even want to know me anymore. I really needed somebody to speak to. And one time I did. And the guy woke me up to his house. When he shut the door over, he put a couple of tablets in my drink. I fell asleep. And he ate me. It's not long after that. My best pal died. He got knocked in a car accident. God bless him. Three weeks later, I came back to Glasgow City Centre. I'm in about 18 now. I've got work to go to. So I need to be home four hours before I get to work. So we worked through this housing scheme. Like a scheme that we used to fight with. I'm walking up a hill, two guys come down. They asked me what time it was, so I gave them the time, and do you know what they said to me? Do you know what they fucking said to me? They said it was starving time, and do you know what I thought? Is that fucking right? Then and there, that was my time, a time to prove myself in front of my other so-called pals. They two ran away, but I stood still and I fought back. I managed to get away for a wee while. I didn't realise I was stabbed. I ran out of breath and I fell to the ground. See when I got stabbed? I felt as if I was dying. But you know something, when, when I thing in my life, I felt peaceful. And I looked up and I seen all these wee leaves on the tree. And that night was really, really quiet. So the guys walked away, then they came back and they put out bigger knives. I was stabbed 17 times, slashed, they bitted my head open, they punched me about the place, but I kept fighting back, I kept fighting back. I suppose that's the fight in me. Went to the hospital, it was in there for two weeks. I was told I nearly died. So I got, I got somewhat better. As soon as I got better, I didn't take long until I was hanging about with my so-called pals again. Father, I have fallen to the shadows of my sin. Take a bit of oil. 
realizing that we stabbed. I didn't really take into account that I nearly died. I mean, you would actually think you would actually want to get your life sorted out once and for all, wouldn't you? But then again, I took it, I took it like a man. Didn't speak about my problems. Didn't speak about anything. My man and dad were really worried about me. Everybody thought it was a Ned. The thing is, I was a Ned. When I got better, I started hanging about the streets again. Things were a wee bit quiet for a while. But it didn't take long. On a Christmas night, me and my pals were drinking again. We were taking some speed. We went night clubbing. As far as we were, we were concerned, you know, it's like we were having a brilliant time. We loved all that hardcore music. We were up dancing all night. But I knew, I just knew there was something no, right about my health. I was falling. I was basically falling on the wayside. That night we got, we got involved in a fight. We were caught in CCTV. We ended up fighting with another young team. And then we got jailed. We were in a police station for four days. When the CID spoke to us, they told the authorities that we were done for attempted murder and assault. We got bail. For 12 months later, we tried to make the best of it. We got steaming. We were taking a lot of drugs at the time. Eggies, coke, hash, you name it, everything. Gambling, that came out of my life in a big way. I was looking for escapism. I had all these crashing thoughts come into my mind, I didn't know how to deal with them. I couldn't explain them. I couldn't find words for them. The main echoes I took, the worse my mind got. My emotions were out of the place. Sometimes I would burst out laughing, sometimes I would talk to myself. Some people would actually walk by or drive by and they would take the piss at us. Yet again, girlfriends came and went. We couldn't handle it. I was totally wavered. I became a liar, a cheat, a thief, a con artist, a frauder. I became really, really violent. I wanted to pay back. As I said before, the world owed me something, something massive. I took a massive resentment on God. I lost my faith. But guess what? We all went to court, didn't we? The High Court. And very few people could actually come back out there. I went to Bologna and pulled my offenders for two and a half years of my life. When I walked into prison, my head was totally messed up. I didn't know I had depression. I didn't know that I had anxiety issues. My head was the other place. I had a girlfriend at the time. But every and again I would hear I would hear stories. You see all these pals that I had, these so-called pals, they were all shagging her. And the thing is, I really loved her. It was just another thing. Another thing that I had to deal with. After four months imprisonment, I started doing weightlifting. I started sorting my life out. And I swore to myself I would never drink or take drugs or gamble ever again. 
I put myself through hurt and a lot of pain and a lot of misery. I was fucking raging, by the way. People used to say I was mental and I was crazy. They used to call me Syndrome. And other people would call me Time Bomb. We go quiet for a wee while and then I would, I would just totally fucking explode, you know what I mean? You're probably wondering why I'm telling you all this. Maybe it will help you. But then again, maybe it won't. Being in prison wasn't easy. But to tell you the truth, there was a bit like a holiday camp. We even had a swimming pool, with a Sky TV. We had five aside for the pitches. See, to be brutally honest, I wasn't a brilliant time in there. The thing is, I was in recovery. I was chomping for a drink. I was totally addicted to eggies. But I knew being in there, I was going to keep myself sober, drug free and gamble free. I see it as a blessing. Because I believe if I still had that lifestyle before I got to jail, I would have probably been dead. But the thing is, I kept myself right in there. I maintained a good behaviour bond. Slowly and surely, slowly and surely the, the time passed and life started to brighten up again. I swore to myself that I would never get myself involved in that much trouble ever again in my life. See, the day I see it as if it was somebody that was insane. I was somebody that was right agitated. Doubtful, restless, discontented, even irritable. I didn't know I had a spiritual malady issue. A man that I even thought was possessed by a devil. I was hurting at the time, really, really hurting. Having that good behaviour bond helped me a lot. I ended up with a DCAT and ended up in an open jail. Every and again we were allowed to, to go to Tesco or allowed to go out for a jog or um, even go for a sunbed. Having home leaves was actually having home leaves was actually really really good. It was good for me. I was allowed to do it once a month every weekend. Things were becoming better. I realised I was coming to a time where I was going to get released out of prison. Before I knew it, I did. And the old behaviour came back in. The old patterns. My mental health kicked in in a big way. I started arguing with my man dad again. I was very fortunate at the time to get a job. I worked there for a wee while. Then I ended up with another girlfriend, and she ended up pregnant. I told her my whole life story. I shouldn't have told her my weakness. I told her that I was adopted as well. I wasn't very sure about her when I was going there. To be honest, I didn't love her. I don't think that she loved me either. But she was pregnant, and she said to me, Do you love me, Kevin? And I says, I don't know. She then said, if you don't love me, you're not seeing your win. Within a couple of days, that relationship was over. So I went back to my dad's house to live for a while. Yet again, I tried to get my life sorted out. I always used to say it myself, I need to get my heat sorted out. I need to get my heat sorted out. I need to get my heat sorted out. But really, I never did. Drinking came in really, really big. I was going back to 
the dancing, I was hanging about with other people because my so-called pals, well, they were still in prison serving their times as well. The arguments kept happening, my man and dad kept falling out ways. I started lying again, I started cheating, I started stealing. My dad said to me, Kevin, name one thing that's good about you. Do you know what I said to my dad? I said it was funny. After everything that I put my man and dad through, and all my relatives and all my pals, I was an absolute disgrace to the local community. Shadows of my sin. I am weary, heavy laden, and my burden lies within. Temptation finds me wanting, ever thirst to grow and cold. And my spirit has diminished to the slumber of my soul. Things were only really very good for me. I was full of resentment. I was full of revenge. There was absolutely nothing good about myself and I knew that. I couldn't see one good thing about myself. I really cared about what other people thought about us. And I see myself as a total letdown. See the guy who raped me? I ended up tying his pub. I knew how it hurt him. So I loved his pub and I knew that I could never ever go back there ever again to the East End of Glasgow. I tried to commit suicide. I tried to find myself half a bridge. I left my man down out. I basically said that I was sorry for everything that I've done. I totally let myself go. For some godly reason, I didn't commit suicide that day and see all the money that I took out of the guy's pub. I put it in the puggy machines. And do you know something? That was the only time I ever won money out of a puggy. I was trying to get rid of it. I didn't want the money and I kept on winning. So I walked through Buchanan Street, or Gale Street, and I was getting the money away. I thought my man and I, I was totally steaming at the time. I was full of misery. Full of regret. I knew that I had to declare myself homeless. I was in and out of homelessness for a number of years. I was probably in every single hostel in Glasgow and South Lanarkshire. I was rattling cocaine at the time. I used to snort it into his business. I started selling ecstasy and cocaine. I thought that would change my ways. My ego came in in a big way. Every time I started cocaine, I always get confidence in myself. It was like this shadow effect. That I'd be safe and secure. As if I could actually stun up for myself once and for all. Being in and out of homelessness wasn't for me. A lot of people said in the homeless sector, you shouldn't be here, wee man. You shouldn't be here. Go back to your man there. But I couldn't go back to my man that because I put them through that much. Ever since 2002, I haven't seen my daughter and she's nearly 10 years of age. 
It's just like, you know, Abby, I love you very, very much. And I hope one day I'm going to see you very soon. In 2005, I had a support worker at the time. And they wanted to be going this college course. It was about film making. I had an opportunity to make a short film. I seen film making and acting as my way out. For the last seven or eight years, I've been doing acting and film making because I'm passionate about it and I'm enthusiastic. I love putting identification into film, social awareness concepts and getting as many people involved as much as possible. I became self-employed in 2007 and it's one of the best years ever. I was commissioned by the Scottish Government and National Health Service about social awareness projects. I was doing corporate film, independent film, short films, feature films, music videos, commercials, you name it, I was doing it all. But I couldn't budget my money. I couldn't get enough of cocaine. I couldn't get enough alcohol. I couldn't stop gambling. My whole life was a mess. Take me up to the age of 30. I was with this lassie. I was back in the East End of Glasgow. It was a relationship that I didn't want to be involved in. And I seen that place where I lived as hell. The relationship wasn't working out. It was very volatile. I was like one of the battered husbands. I was vulnerable, very open, and I couldn't make any sense. The drink, the drugs and the gambling took over my life in a big way. I see myself as an addict and an alcoholic and a compulsive gambler. My speech spent, I couldn't speak. And I thought, how am I going to act in film making if my speech is going to go? The thing is, hanging about with that, with that ex-girlfriend of mine, she was just another one I came to you for. It was just another relationship that just wasn't working out. The thing is, I didn't have any time. I had no time at all for anybody. I mean, how could I possibly love anybody else if I couldn't love myself? Think about it. Having a mind where you just wanted a drink, you wanted the snort, powder up your nose, you wanted the pop pills. See all the jobs that I had in the past? Not one of them worked out. Not one of them. The only thing that did work out for me was acting and film making. I seen it as my way out. That relationship was really volatile. It was very violent. I just knew, I just knew that I was getting used and abused and exploited once again. I remember lying in her bed. She was sleeping at the time. I was in a lot of debt with drug dealers. And guess what? I got slashed again. Enough was enough. I put myself through that much trauma. I wouldn't want anybody to live like that. That isn't a lifestyle and it certainly isn't a life. I need to stay motivated. I need to deal with my past. I need to speak about my problems so that they lose the power. You see, for the last two and a half year I haven't been homeless. I try my best not to drink. I try my best not to take any drugs. And I try my very best not to gamble. These days, I've got my family back in my life. My relatives. My friends. And surprisingly, I am a single man. So, if you're out there and you're looking for a guy, you know. I don't know. You know, be intuitively think not. 
always hated being homeless. But I had to deal with my issues. So I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. I went to Cocaine Anonymous. I went to Gambles Anonymous. I started paying my bills. I started paying my debts. I started sorting my life out. I went through the 12 steps and I got myself a sponsor. And I know that person today. And I'd like to thank him very much because I see him like a dad. He can identify with me. He knows everything about me. He always tells me, I always use a spiritual toolkit. And a part of that toolkit is reading my Bible as well. As well as a big book. I know who I am now. I've got identity. I don't need to act like that anymore. It's a time for everything. It's a time to change. I need to change. Because I don't want to be seen anymore. I still do acting, I still do filmmaking. I really love it. It helps me. And I believe it helps others. I see a lot of happiness there. And a lot of encouragement. And I work with the very, very best in the Scottish film industry. See if, I've, see if I've every hurt and pain that I've caused in the past, or the lies, or the cheating, the thieving, the conning, the frauding, the corruption, and being violent. I'm really sorry for all that. I'm really sorry for every hurt and pain I've put you through. And that goes to everybody. The people, the places, the things, even the situations. I know that you won't forget, but I'm hoping in the name of Jesus, that you will forgive me. I swear my side of the street, and I need to move on. This year, on the 23rd of February, I got a call on to be a priest. Why would God want me to be a priest? After everything I put myself through and everybody else, I really don't know. Through acceptance, this is something that I do know. Nothing, absolutely nothing happens in God's world by mistake. Until I could accept all my addictions, I could not stay clean. Unless I accept life completely on life's terms. I can't be happy. I need to remain faithful. I need to be myself. I don't need to prove anything any longer. I've got confidence now. I've got self-esteem. And I've got real friends in my life now. I've got a brilliant family. I've got amazing relatives.
Right, so, anyway, I made that amendment. It's time to say thanks. I would like to thank everybody. And anybody. Every, everybody for the past. I need to thank you for sticking by me. I need to thank you for believing in me and having faith. For being my friend and helping me out when I most needed it. For all the support and all the assistance. I've set myself free in the name of Jesus. That's the way I see it. You see whatever you're doing with your life, I hope it's a good one. And God bless you. I need to thank everybody. I need to thank all my family, my relatives, and all my real friends, and everybody else that's in my life. I need to thank, I need to thank all the film casts and all the film crew that I've worked with over the last seven years. Without you, these films wouldn't have been made. I really need to thank you, and I'm very grateful for this, that you've stopped by me, you've listened to me, you've believed in me, you've trusted me. You've actually been decent people. You've actually helped me with this journey that I'm on just now. I'm just so glad I'm not drinking today. I'm not taking any drugs. I'm not gambling. I'm acting. I'm acting as myself. And I'm on a film set. I'm home. God bless every one of you. And thanks very much for watching this. See you soon. Well, uh, it was one Sunday morning I was going up to, to, to Mass, it was uh, 9 o'clock Mass in the morning and this chap was walking up the road in front of me and uh, I thought he was just going to walk up to the guy coming in for a night out or something, you know, for been out all night or whatever and then I seen him turning into the, into the chapel, so um, I thought well that's a good young guy, I don't recognise him but he's going into Mass and as, as I was going up the stairs, I caught up with him and I was passing him and he asked me, eh, eh, is it, is it, am I at the right time, is it 9 o'clock mass? I said, yeah, it's 9 o'clock mass. So that was it and that was my initial eh, meeting with him. And he said to me, he had an amazing experience that week, eh, in the middle of the week, I think it was a Wednesday or Thursday or something, he said he had an amazing experience. I said, well, if you want to speak to me, speak to me after you come out, after you come out of mass, because mass is ready to start in a few minutes. So, so he was there when I came out and that's how I met him and he told me about his life story. He told me about his life story and that and what happened to him and that and how he did this amazing spiritual experience during the week. That's how I got to know him initially. He started his own film company and um, I think he's going places. Well I think we first met on the uh, set of Infiltrated, so started off knowing him as a an actor then get involved with him as a, a director and so on, so uh, yeah, well-rounded, talented guy. Uh, he's a guy who's helping me um, get into production because he makes films and um, tells great stories about his life and other things. Well, I don't know if they will, because I mean, I don't know how far they're going to go, how do I know that, but I'll tell you this, I hope they do, because his life story is quite uh, traumatic and dramatic as well, and, um, uh, and if these can help uh, young people in this world today be drinking drugs, gambling, sex, all the addictions of the world that's destroying young lives, I hope they're successful, I hope they're big time successful. I certainly hope so. It's a very hard hitting film. He's gone to a lot of trouble and effort to put his soul out there and um, it will touch a lot of people 
In fact, I think it will touch everyone because there's so many things that have happened to him in his life that relate to each and every one of us. But certainly it's an interesting backstory. I think um, it's going to prove inspirational for the people who actually see the film. So yeah, I think it's got uh, good potential. I think the film will definitely go somewhere because um, it's a really interesting story and it deserves to be um, heard by uh, many people. Well, he's a guy I've come to know quite well. He's uh, quite intense and quite intense with what he's, he, he's taking on and he, he's told me a lot about himself and, 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 and I hope and, and pray that the things he hopes in life, his hopes are, 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 are uh, he'll live his hopes and his dreams will come, will come through. I really, for the bottom of heart, I mean that, you know. I'm well, just looking forward to uh, working the other days of the shoot. Uh, looking forward to having it finished and actually releasing cinemas. <laughs> I just really hope that the film goes well and I hope that people see it because um, it could be really helpful for people and it's there's something in it for everyone because uh, it's such a amazing story. I would recommend everyone to come and see this film and at least form their own opinions of it. Um, come and be amazed at things and that can happen to you and you can still stand up there and fight back. I think Chumbawamba said it when they said I get knocked down but I get up again and I think that is the embodiment of this film. No matter how many times he's been knocked down he still gets up again and it's something that everyone should try to do in their own life. It doesn't matter what knocks you get, keep going. Because good things can happen if you just keep plodding on. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive the sin we are in debt as we forgive our debtors. not into temptation deliver us from Yours is the 
king.